Rumor becomes reality, and the worst kept secret in Silicon Valley is now official. Twitter names Jack Dorsey its permanent CEO. Chang and this is Bloomberg West. Coming up, 2015 was supposed to be the year of Apple Pay, at least according to CEO Tim Cook. So why aren't consumers signing up? Plus, new reports Amazon is getting ready to take on heavyweights like Microsoft and SAP in helping companies analyze their data. And tech giants like Facebook and Google get ready for new global tax rules that could squeeze profits. First, to our lead, the man who co-founded and ran Twitter before being ousted in 2008 is now back on the job for good, at least for now. Twitter today naming Jack Dorsey its permanent CEO. Yes, he remains CEO of his mobile payments firm Square that's expected to go public this year. This despite the board initially saying they wanted someone who could commit full time. Dorsey made the case and on Twitter and he did it so in a series of tweets saying I've been CEO of both companies for over three months now. I have the smartest, strongest and most determined leaders in the world on my teams. Meantime, Twitter director and head of the CEO search Peter Curry said today over time it became clear to us that Jack was not only meeting but surpassing our expectations of him as interim CEO while running Square. Joining me now here in the studio, in our new studio, John Patel, chairman and co-founder of Nuco and longtime tech industry watcher. We've got Adam Satariano, who's been covering Twitter for us, as well as Victor Anthony, managing director at Axiom Capital Management, who raised Twitter to a buy today. But John, I want to start with you. What's your reaction to this? Well, I think everyone was wondering whether this was a three-month job tryout, and now we know. Um, it was. The early buzz was that it wasn't going to be Jack. It couldn't be Jack. He was taking Square Public. How could he possibly do that and turn Twitter around? Something must have happened in three months to change not only the board's mind, but I think more importantly, the people who are now reporting to Jack. You know, it's interesting. He talked about his strong teams. Adam Bain, of course, is being promoted to COO. Victor, why are you so optimistic here? Why doesn't it bother you that he's running two companies? Well, first off, I just want to make a clear upgrade of the stock prior to the announcements early in the morning. Um, listen, I am somewhat apprehensive about him being a CEO of two companies. Um, both companies operate in industries that are um, uh, highly innovative, um, uh, are rife with intense competition. And so I think both companies will need dedicated CEOs at some point. But I think stepping away from Square right now will be disruptive to the IPO. So I think it's fine for him to stay on um, over six, nine months. But at some point, I think he'll, ne he'll need to step away from Square. There are several you know, capable, I think, um, uh, payment CEOs across the country that could step in and run Square while he focuses his efforts on, on, uh, on Twitter. But you know, if we look out for a year from now when Twitter stock is at 50, 60, I think all of this would be a moot point. Now, it's interesting. You would think that this announcement would bring some clarity to the situation. But of course, now there are more questions. Well, how long is he going to remain CEO of Square? John, I mean, what do you, what do you think? Well, at least they're in the same town. Um, <laughs> Actually, they're across the street yeah, from each other. They're so very close helps. to each other. Um, and, and they're at different stages. Uh, it really does depend on his team. And for me, the, the, the big question is, I mean, we got a chief operating officer role for Adam. That was a very important move, I think, to secure Adam. Um, how long he can keep that team together. There was so much work done on the product, and it's about to pay off uh, with Project Lightning and other things. It really were the work of Dick Costello prior to, uh, to Jack coming in as interim. So we'll see how that pans out. If it gets very difficult, uh, it might get harder again. Dick Costello, however, stepping off the board, and Jack Adam insinuating that there is going to be some more board shakeup happening. How will that play out? It brings to mind, of course, when Steve Jobs came back to Apple and basically changed the entire board. Yeah, I mean, they're putting their faith in, in Jack Dorsey to, to lead the turnaround of the company, but there's going to be a lot of challenges ahead. And, and, and like we were talking about in terms of the new Project Lightning, which is a way for people to see more uh, tweets coming through. I mean, the product is incredibly difficult for people who are not really hardcore users to, to figure out or find entertaining. And so expanding the audience and getting more people introduced to it and becoming more of the daily users is going to be a big piece of this. Because right now, the company, although it's very influential and a lot of people in media and journalists certainly use it, uh, I think with more 
a mainstream audience that hasn't really taken off, and the company is still losing gobs of money every quarter. You also have mainstream users like Lena Dunham, for example, recently saying that she was thinking about getting off Twitter full time because she couldn't handle the hate. This is something that Dick Costell admitted they needed to do more work on. But Victor, you know, as someone who just upgraded the stock, does that concern you? You have some of the most high profile users on Twitter saying they can't handle it anymore. Well, um, to be clear, Twitter has signed up, I think, in excess of a billion users. The problem is to get those users to come back. So they do have a retention problem. And so one or two, or probably 10, 20, you know, high profile users jumping off, you know, I don't think that's really an issue for the stock. I think it's just get those additional 700 million users to come back to the platform to use it on, on, on a daily basis. So retention, more uh, incremental users, and getting those users engaged on a daily basis, I think is the issue for, um, for Twitter going forward. It's a tall order, um, but I think Project Lightning, as you talked about, there's a marketing plan, an advertising campaign that's soon to launch. There's a Google integration, I think that'll get deeper over the next several months. I think those three should help um, in 2016 get more users back onto the platform and get them more engaged. I want to drill into this point, John, about the negativity on Twitter because, you know, the anonymity of Twitter, while it's always been part of the product from the very beginning, it does breed, it breeds hate, you know? Yeah. I've been on the receiving end of it. I'm sure you've been on oh, the receiving sure. end of it. Yeah. And even though Dick Costell vowed to clamp down on it, honestly, I haven't seen much of a change. They have to change the fundamental way you understand why you interact with Twitter if you're an average user. And that's really what Project Lightning is going after, is making it a place where you can see events that matter right now, organized for you, curated by both algorithms and by editors. They've been hiring hundreds of editors over the past uh, six months. And I think when they roll out with Lightning, they're going to create another user experience that is going to be less personal and direct and more about consuming and understanding what's happening in real time right now. But there is a risk that if you change the product too much, right, that you alienate the people who like it the way it is, right? Yeah, I mean, that's been a core challenge for Twitter now from, from almost the beginning. I mean, they have a very passionate user base that has a megaphone, which is Twitter itself, where they kind of talk to each other about it. But I think uh, if that's part of the reason that you see the company going to Jack Dorsey is that as a founder, uh, he brings a certain amount of credibility to make some of these bigger changes that the company could need. All right, well, all eyes on Jack Dorsey, of course, and shares did go up, uh, you know, as a result of this move. So we'll be watching if Dorsey can keep it up. But, John, before you go, I want to talk to you about Nuco. Uh, you yes. are uh, launching your, your conference this week. This is, a, yes. as we discussed, a new take on conferences. And Twitter's opening their doors. E exactly. <laughs> so you got to give us the inside scoop. But well, tell us about the highlights. So, I mean, the idea is it's a completely different kind of conference. Inside out, we have over 200 companies in the Bay Area opening their doors. And the attendees, instead of going into a ballroom, go around the city and go into sessions inside the most innovative companies in the Bay Area. We do it in 16 cities around the world, but this week is time for Oakland and San Francisco. And I think one of the highlights is absolutely going to be Twitter. Um, <laughs> Who's they talking a, to you? Uh, well, they have a full session and they're doing a round table of executives. And my gut is that they might mix it up given this news, so I'm not quite sure. Um, I was just trying to find out, but I couldn't. <laughs> but a lot of other great companies from Uber and Lyft through uh, you know, Tech Shop and all sorts of interesting smaller businesses as well. Well, hopefully your, your attendees will get to, to see a glimpse of Jack, the uh, new and permanent CEO, for now. We'll see how, we'll see how long it lasts. Um, you know, one last question, bringing the founder back to a company, John, you know, do you think, how optimistic are you about, you well, know, is, you, you, you've known him for a I've long time. Done. You've <laughs> known him for many years. You knew Dick Costolo. Yeah. Is he a different person now than when he was? Oh, absolutely. Out of the I mean, first of all, he's learned so much. Square has not been exactly a you know a, a ride on a unicorn. Square has had its ups and downs, as has Twitter. So he's learned a lot from that. Um, I think he would only do this if he truly understood the work involved. I've not really noticed many founders going to two companies and treating them equally. There's always Tesla and. SpaceX. Really? Yeah, because there's someone always said to me, hey, Apple you have and two kids? Pixar. And I said and they, yes, and they yeah. said, do you love Which one more you... than the other? And I said, of course not. But the truth is, I think that the <laughs> folks at Square are going to have to get used to playing second fiddle. I don't see any way around it. Hmm. Interesting. Well, we obviously are going to be watching what happens with Square. John Battelle of Nuco, Adam Satariano of Bloomberg News. Adam, you're sticking with us, as well as Victor Anthony of Axiom. Victor, thank you so much thank you. for joining us. Now, to a crackdown on corporate tax dodging, dozens of world economies are close to adopting sweeping changes to international tax rules that could impact major tech companies like Google 
and Apple. This is important because these tax loopholes are believed to deprive governments of up to $240 billion a year. That's why the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development released a plan today that aims to end tax shelters and require companies to pay taxes in the countries where they earn a profit. So far, 62 governments, companies, and non-governmental groups were involved in negotiating this plan. It'll be discussed at a meeting of G20 finance ministers in Lima this week on Thursday, and if approved, it will then be presented to the group's leaders in Turkey in November for a vote on adoption. Coming up, the year of Apple Pay falls short. We will have the details next. And the highly anticipated Steve Jobs movie is set to premiere this Friday. Michael Fassbender, who plays the former Apple CEO, was not the first or even the second choice for the role, but he's already getting Oscar buzz. I've met everyone and spent a lot of time with. Thank you, Thank you so much. I can hear you. Yes. I can't. I can't hear anything. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Oh, now I do. Yes. David, you'll be on. Here. Got it. Okay. And gentlemen, you will not be looking at each other. You'll just be looking directly into your cameras. <laughs> uh, should I be this high? <laughs> uh, it'll be fine. They're gonna they're gonna frame you up fine. Oh, I'm gonna look like a little. I was gonna say we're gonna make John look so little. Yeah. John should be in the high one. I should be in the low one. <laughs> no, it'll just pretty much just be a frame here. Uh, it won't even. Look I'm like gonna ask Scott. Did you hear me? Uh, what can you ask you me want? about the movie? Say, like, All right, about a minute back, guys. Like, <laughs> uh, you can say the reviews have been good. I mean, you can. There's a Wall Street Journal story today about how Lorraine Jobs was basically behind the scenes. Friday marks the long-awaited premiere of the Steve Jobs biopic. Michael Fassbender, who plays the late Apple co-founder, is already getting rave reviews. But he wasn't the first or even the second choice for the part. First choice was Leonardo DiCaprio, reportedly. Then screenwriter Aaron Sorkin told me Christian Bale was up for the part, but talks with Bale broke down. Even Sony dropped the project under pressure from Jobs' wife, Laureen Powell Jobs. But... That drama will soon be Hollywood history as it opens in limited theaters this Friday. The film also stars Kate Winslet, Seth Rogen, and Jeff Daniels, who plays former Apple CEO John Scully. In my interview with Sorkin last year, he had this to say about Apple's real-life cast. But I've met everyone and spent a lot of time with the other seven characters uh, uh, who are in the movie, like Waz. Um, uh, uh, Joanna Hoffman, uh, who's a fantastic character. She was the head of marketing uh, uh, for the Mac team. John Scully, um, uh, who was the CEO uh, of Apple and became famous or infamous, uh, depending on how you look at it, for firing uh, uh, Steve Jobs from Apple. He's a wonderful man and a, a, a great character. And Joining me now from New York, John Scully himself, uh, the former CEO of Apple, president of Pepsi, now co-founder of uh, Zeta. Also with me here in the studio, still with us, Adam Satariano. So, John, I know you talked with Aaron Sorkin, obviously. What was your experience in working with Aaron Sorkin? Have you seen the movie, and what do you think? Well, I uh, really loved Aaron, Aaron Sorkin. He's incredibly talented. Um, I have seen the movie. They gave us a private showing, my wife Diane and I. Uh, it's incredible entertainment. It captures uh, definitely a, you know, a, an important side of Steve's personality. But I have to tell you, because I knew Steve as a great friend, the young Steve Jobs, and he was a very you know, real person. He had a sense of humor. He, he was passionate about being a perfectionist. But he was uh, just fun to be around, and the people who worked with him 
uh, had a lot of respect for him. So people need to look at Steve Jobs, uh, not just in the context of this movie, Emily, but the real Steve Jobs was, was, was a really great guy. Okay, but what about Jeff Daniels' portrayal of you? Did you think that was spot on? Well, it Jeff must be hard to watch yourself played in a movie. <laughs> well, Jeff Daniels is very talented, and uh, the, the cast did a terrific job. Um, I think Kate Winslet uh, will probably be up for an Oscar nomination, maybe Michael Fassbender as well. Uh, Jeff Daniels you know, could get a supporting nomination. So th this is first-class entertainment, and it takes cr creative license, as you might expect. Same thing that happened, apparently, with social networks. They took a lot of creative license, but they built an incredibly entertaining story. Now, Adam, what are you hearing about the movie? Because, I mean, it's, it's getting very good, good reviews, despite all of the drama leading up to this. There is a lot of drama involved in it, which is probably going to end up being good for the, uh, the premiere weekend. But uh, there's mixed feelings about it, particularly from, from people who are close to Apple, uh, or in jobs, uh, as you mentioned, it kind of work behind the scenes a little bit to squ squash the movie. Uh, and Apple itself and some of the executives at the company are have mixed feelings about it because it's based on uh, Walter Isaacson's book, Steve Jobs, which many people at the company uh, did not like, saying it captured only uh, one side of, of Steve Jobs. And so I think that the movie was based on that book is where a root of a lot of the issues are for people who are close to Steve. Now, I do want to talk to you about, you know, Apple today. You know, we've got a story out about Apple Pay. It's been a year since Apple Pay. Tim Cook said it would be the year of Apple Pay, and yet it's, it's not seeing a lot of adoptions yet by retailers and also consumers, you know, what's going wrong? Do we just need to give Apple some time? I, th I don't think this is a problem that's unique to Apple. I think that the mobile payments thus far hasn't, the hype hasn't really matched up with reality. And, it, and I think a big part of it is that taking out a debit card and having it swiped at a Starbucks is not a very difficult thing to do, and most people think it's just fine. And so the idea of taking out a phone, putting your thumbprint over the thing, and having it work is just kind of a, a little bit of a cumbersome process. But you see it coming to Apple Watch, and so there's some other elements to it that over time that maybe some of that friction will deteriorate and get better. But right now, it's really just not making much of a dent in the way that people make payments. Mm -hmm. We're, where it is having good uh, doing well is, is when somebody's downloading an app or something like that and you can very quickly right. make a, 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 a digital purchase. Now, John Scully, I, I also want to talk to you about what you're working on now and that is Zeta Interactive. Your co-founder and CEO David Steinberg is also with us now. This is, you know, attempting to take on this big sort of problem of, of data analytics competing with the likes of Microsoft with Salesforce, uh, you know, David, we just heard Amazon announcing a new analytics product. You know, what, what makes you think that Zeta has what it takes? Well, we laugh. We like to say, John and I, we have some very small competitors like IBM, Oracle, <laughs> Adobe, Salesforce. Uh, what we do is very different in that we take our clients' data and we make it actionable. Whereas most of our competitors focus only on CRM or helping companies keep their customers longer, we do the entire life cycle. So we help our clients create new customers in addition to keeping them longer and selling them more products by using massive pools of disparate data and combining them into solutions. So, John, you know, as someone who's been through, you know, so many sort of eras of technology from Apple and then, you know, Pepsi and now Zeta, you guys raised, you know, like $125 million at a billion dollar valuation in this age of unicorns now and, and talk of potentially another bubble. How do you deliver on, on the promise of Zeta and, and manage your own strategy in what could be a, t a crunch for, for private tech companies? Well, I've been in consumer marketing for uh, almost my entire career, and this is the logical next step in consumer marketing. It's all about data, and Zeta, under David Steinberg's leadership, has just been an incredible story. And it will cross over 200 million in revenue this year. We're highly profitable. Uh, we're just announcing a major expansion of our Hyderabad facility by 50,000 feet. We'll be adding another 200 people. Uh, this is a company that just has huge momentum, and yes, we are a unicorn, but we think we've just begun to build the real value for Zeta. All right, John Scully and David Steinberg, co-founder of Zeta Interactive. Thank you both, and Adam Satariano of Bloomberg News. Thanks. Thank you for having us. Coming
Coming up, how will Amazon's new analytics tool help lock in more customers? We'll introduce you what, to what they're calling Space Needle next. To another story we are watching, it seems as though Chinese President Xi has rejected Mark Zuckerberg's friend request. At a White House dinner last week, Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg reportedly asked President Xi to give his unborn baby an honorary Chinese name. President Xi refused, saying it was too much responsibility. Zuckerberg tried to use his baby's name to ease tension. Facebook has been blocked in China since 2009 when the social site was allegedly used to organize anti-government riots. Zuckerberg would love to crack China's 600 million, million internet users. During the visit, President Xi said the internet would expand in China, but that it must be in line with, quote, national realities. Now, to Amazon's cloud business. Amazon Web Services is expected to announce a new service this week to help businesses analyze their data. This according to the Wall Street Journal. The new service is codenamed Space Needle and could help Amazon lock in AWS customers by housing even more of their data on the platform. Many big companies already store data on AWS, like Netflix, Airbnb, Yelp. But Space Needle is expected to help Amazon compete in the business intelligent market, which, as we just discussed, is pretty crowded. Could be worth as much as $143 billion in 2016, according to market research firm Pringle & Company. Joining me now to discuss, Boris Evelson, a vice president at Forrester Research and via Skype from Seattle, VP of product management at Tam Tableau, Francois Agenstadt. So, um... Boris, I want to start with you because you said that this service could be like the 800-pound gorilla. Why are you so optimistic about it? Well, AWS is already present in the market. A lot of customers, as you said, already have data in A AWS. They've got tons of databases that already work in AWS, like Redshift. Uh, Amazon um, has all sorts of ways for customers to get data uh, into uh, into the cloud. So uh, we've been waiting for this for, for many years. Uh, obviously, I cannot confirm or deny anything. Amazon officially has not re uh, uh, announced this, but based on my my general knowledge of the market based on uh, um, kind of where the things uh, have been trending for the last several years. Uh, I'd say uh, there will be an entrance into the market by an 800-pound gorilla, and it'll be big. So, Francois, you know, Tableau, this would put Tableau in competition with Amazon. You know, how big a threat do you think this is? Well, I think, first of all, it's important to note that Amazon is a great partner of Tableau's. You know, they provide phenomenal data services and making it really easy and fast and approachable. And Tableau connects and un unlocks all of that data. But what's important to note is that customers have data all over the place, from data in Amazon to on-premises to Excel. And Tableau really facilitates making it easy for anybody to connect to that data and make sense of it. What we're really delivering is analytics for everyone. And that's a key differentiator. All right, Boris, do you think a company like Tableau has something to worry about here? No, I don't think so, uh, Emily, because uh, even though we've been in this market, I've been in this market for 30 years, information management, data warehousing, the BI, okay. business intelligence, analytics, data visualization market has been around for about 20 years. It's still okay. extremely a green field opportunity. Uh, only about 40% of enterprise data. We're going to have data. to leave it there, Boris. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I know we could talk about this for, for hours. Boris Evelson, Francois Agenstadt, thank you both. We're going to be at the Vanity Fair conference tomorrow. Don't miss it.